All right, here we go, guys. And I'm in Central Florida, specifically Titusville. Here we are on the Indian River. I'm with Matt McDonald, the owner and founder of Falcon Marine, and we're on his beautiful Falcon 22 offshore catamaran, a small catamaran, one of the very few makers of smaller catamarans. And we are going to do a full on-the-water test of the boat, go over all its features, and more importantly for the boat nerd in me and hopefully the boat nerd in you, we are going to see how these beautiful boats are built. And we're going to get a great history into this company, Falcon, at their sprawling Titusville, Florida facility. And we're going to cut right to Matt introducing his brand, his company, and how this beautiful Falcon 22 is made. All right, here we go, guys. We're here at Falcon Boats in Titusville, Florida. I'm here with Matt, the owner, founder, president, CEO, and as we just said, the janitor. He literally does almost <laughs> everything here at Falcon Boats. And uh, for those of you that don't know, though, you would have heard my intro, Falcon Boats, a maker of a really premium 22-foot center console, um, and really interesting story behind Falcon Boats, relatively new to the boat industry, but certainly not new to the marine composite, fiberglass, whatever you want to call it, industry, 30 years. Matt, uh, if you don't mind, share the history of the company with us. So yeah, my name is Matt McDonald. Um, like you said, I'm owner of Falcon Marine, and um, we're building currently a bay style 22 and an offshore style 22 foot center console catamarans, um, and working to grow that brand. We've been in the composite business since 93. Um, I started as a product development company. So we designed composites, designed custom processes, um, and, and helped people who wanted to build items out of composites get started. Um, companies like Cushman Tractor, uh, if they needed a new hood, they would come with a drawing, we would help them design their part. Uh, design the process, build the tooling, develop the processes, and then turn that over to them, um, so forth. Um, and at some point, that segued into working with uh, boat companies as well. Correct. So one of the big, we originally were in Omaha, Nebraska when we started. So not necessarily what you would think of as a large Not the marine boating capital area. of the world? However, uh, Genmar was not too far away from us. Okay. Um, and we ended up doing some projects with them to help them get their VEX system working at the time. Um, so at one point we were building the equivalent of about 20 boats a day uh, for them. Uh, liner, decks, lids, uh, all the pieces. Right. Um, so. Uh, even today, probably 50% of our business is still outside work for other boat builders, industrial companies, and, and so forth. So yeah, including you were mentioning a, a big government contract. Uh, I thought that was pretty cool. I mean, boating so, related, I guess you could say. Uh, yeah, actually, it's a private uh, company. Oh, okay. Building, it's, it's the new mega yacht uh, must-have toy, uh, which is a, a personal submarine. That's insane. That are, they're, they're going down 3,000 feet, so they're pretty wow. serious, wow. serious vessels. Wow. Um, so we're building the ballast tanks and uh, fairing pieces for submarines. We do a lot of communications and closures for different people. Um, yeah, and then so, at some point, I guess, you were building all these boat parts. You were working with all the major players in the marine industry, and you decided... Exactly. We're doing, we're doing parts for people. We were doing a lot of private label builds. So a lot of boat, we were building complete boats for other people um, to whatever their specifications and things were. Um, about four years ago, we said, hey, you know what? We can build a better boat. <laughs> um, so why not? Let's try and brand our own. So we started basically from scratch developing a brand um, and trying to get out uh, into the public with something that uh, I wanted to own. And, right, and you, you mentioned you wanted to go catamaran. Correct, I'm a multi-hull uh, aficionado, I guess you can say. We built uh, our own line of racing sailboats that were catamarans that I designed and built. Um, so we, we did that for a number of years. Um, so I was really liking catamarans 
as far as what they could offer in a boat. So um, it made sense for us as we were looking to do our own thing um, to try and get into the multi-hull world going yeah, and, that way into the power industry. And you were looking, uh, you and I were talking about this earlier, you, you found a mold basically of a proven design uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so we started researching what um, what we wanted to build out there. Like I said, I wanted to build a boat that you know I would want to own, um, and I wanted to be a multi-hull. And after doing a little bit of research, we found that the old Corsair 2200 foiling cap molds were available by developed by Morelli and Melvin. Um, so we talked with them quite a bit about you know what the boat was, what it could be, what we could do with it, so forth. We ended up getting the molds, uh, basically redoing um, a lot of the layout, the deck, console, um, and put it together for what's now the Falcon 22. Right, so three years, how many boats? So right now we're still in a ramp up process. So, you know, we're looking to do about a boat a week kind of thing. So it's, you know, it's small, but we are a custom, semi-custom build. So we're building every boat on the floor has got the customer's name on it. The guys know who they're building for. Um, everyone's been rigged out differently, you know, so that's kind of, you know, that's important for us that we're building. I'm not looking to build a thousand boats a year kind of thing. I want a company that's building a good product that people are happy to own and we're making each boat, you know, specifically for each customer. Whether you're a hardcore fisherman and you want, you know, 12 transducers and a thousand rod holders to uh, to the guy that, that, that he's not fishing, he wants to go to the sandbar and to the restaurants and he wants cushions and a killer stereo and a mm -hmm. lot of drink holders. All right. Well, why don't we uh, start talking about the design of the boat? We'll head into the shop and we'll pick it up in a second. Okay. All right. Now we're in the lamination shop and Matt, you've laid out some material for us and why don't we go through each of these and you walk us through what each is. Okay. Yeah. One of the things we do um, at Falcon is everything we can possibly make is infused. Um, so traditional fiberglass involves uh, wet out guns, chopper guns, hand lay. Uh, it's very messy and it, it's very limited because as soon as you pull the trigger, you've got 20, 40 minutes before your material's turning hard and it's either in there or it's not. And is it in right? Is it in better? So what we really did as a product development company was to try and come up with processes that optimize what you could do with fiberglass. Awesome. Um, so a traditional, traditional fiberglass and old style boats are chop strand mat. Whether it's sprayed with a chop gun or whether it's in mat form, it's short fibers that are basically just randomly placed. The strength of your material is a function of how long the fibers are and if they're aligned with where your forces are going. So this is awesome. It makes a product quick. Um, and, and as easy. Um, in order to get better strength and, and better properties out of your materials, what they ended up doing originally, they used woven, woven cloth, um, like a, a rough t-shirt material. Um, the problem with that is, is as you load up the material, those fibers are up and over each other. As you straighten them out, they'll micro crack in the resin and so, while it's probably twice as strong as chop strand mat, it's still not as strong as it could be. So what people are using in the boating industry now are uh, materials that are quilted together. So if you look, all of the fibers on this side of the material are running this direction. Mm -hmm. The fibers on the inside are running the opposite direction. What that does is it gives me long fibers that are down flat and I can orient this material so that it fits the way I'm loading my boat. Because um, nothing on a hull ever is in the same 
loading right. condition. So being generic doesn't help you. It just adds weight. Um, so pretty much whether you're open molding, whether you're infusing, everybody's using this material. The difference on what we're trying to do in our builds is optimize which materials we use, as opposed to saying, okay, I'm throwing in 10 layers of this. I'm putting in some of this, some of this, which is the basically the same idea, but the fibers run at 45 degrees as opposed to 90 degrees. Now I can roll out sheets of this material. I've got all the fibers located exactly where I want them for the strength I get. So I can keep my weight down. I can make sure that I've got a stronger product for the same amount of material. So the next thing you kind of move into, and it's a problem with fiberglass in general, is that it, while it's very strong and you, to be light, you have to be thin. Now my, if I make a very thin panel, it's flexible. So the design constraint in fiberglass is always, or is almost always how, how it bends, how stiff the panel is. Um, so what people do in composites is actually try and make it thicker. I can do that by more layers. I can do that by adding core, uh, core material, core-like materials that thicken up, thicken up my product without really adding a lot of weight. Um, so that's where you'll see cord hull sides, uh, definitely cord decks, things like that. Um, so this, for example, is an infusible core material. Um, for the guys that know lamination, that's kind of like a core mat, but I can put this under vacuum and it doesn't crush. Right. This adds some thickness to some of the laminate where I may need it just a little bit thicker, but I don't want to add a lot of weight. This is a Travera material. We use this in a lot of places um, to design our flow for the infusion process, but we'll also use it where I've got um, a lot of things being screwed into the material. It's a polyester fabric, almost like a lining in your jacket. Um, but what it does when it's wet out is it provides great screw retention. Um, so now I can run screws into my part and not have them be ripping out of the boat. Right. Um, same thing when we get into core, when we get into the different core materials. This is kind of an example of some of the things that are going into every single boat and how we try and optimize what we've got going into it. This is a traditional PVC foam core. You'll find this in pretty much every boat. Work, it's got great properties for hull sides, um, decks, places where you're walking, stuff like that. Um, this is, an, is a, also a PVC core. It's, a, it's more of a board. We use this where we're attaching pumps, uh, more things that have screws in them, but um, um, backing plates for some of the lighter load some of the lighter load pieces. Um, this is another different, it's a different core like the PVC, it's a PET, so it's got different properties. So we kind of mix and match so that we provide the best properties for what I'm doing. One's better in compression, one's better in shear. So I wanna make sure that I'm using the right one in the right place. I don't have to go thicker, I don't have to go a higher density, I can just change out the different properties. Um, this is a is that uh, the deck. Yeah, this is a kusa material mm -hmm. that you'll find as a what is commonly used in the marine industry now as a replacement for plywood in the transoms. Right. Um, so it's a transom material. We also use this for backing plates on cleats, high load stuff like that. Now, is it common for marine builders to have this many different types of material, or do some builders, you know, get away with less than this? Just no, for like I said, most. Most of the builders that we've worked with, and it's not everybody, but a lot of them have basically standardized and tried to simplify what they're doing. Right. So they've got, they're using this and, you know, a little bit of that and that, and that's it. Right. So okay. it's, you know. So there's if, a lot more thought and effort that goes into using correct. all this different material. Right. You know, and if they got a structural problem someplace down the road, it's like, well, just put another layer of that there and mm -hmm. away we go. Um, so the idea of what we're trying to do is to optimize what I put in the boat so that it's fitting the purpose that it's in there for. 
not just throwing more in. All right, so we now, we saw some of the material used. I guess next logical step is let, let's let see how the boat building process starts. Sure, so building composites is backwards. You start with a copy of what your finished product is and you put in the outside layer first and then build to the inside from there. Um, so the beginning of our process involves spraying in a gel coat finish into a mold. So what you see here in the orange is the mold. Uh, this cream colored is the actual gel coat that's been sprayed into the mold. And then we apply a skin coat to that gel coat. That provides a cosmetic barrier to the structure behind it, um, as well as it, it helps protect the gel coat while we go into the actual loading for the infusion process. Uh, in the case of like a hull, we'll use specialty resins that are designed to help prevent blistering and stuff like that. So we mix and match what we've got going on to go forward. Um, but once the skin coat's in there, parts come over into this area. Um, that's a hull just getting loaded up. These are a bunch of hard tops that we're making for various customers. Um, but what we'll do now, because these are infused, is we're gonna load all of the material into the part dry. Um, so as opposed to pulling a gun on a chop gun or a wet out gun and just quickly rolling the air out of the material, we can load all of the fiber, all of the core, all of the structural elements into the thing dry. Um, then, it, then it'll get a bag placed over it this will get a vacuum on it and we'll pull resin through the part. Um, because I'm, I'm loading all my parts into the mold dry. I can come back in before I put resin to it and do a check. Did I get all my layers in right? Are all my overlaps in the right place? Are all my fibers in the right direction? Or did I get all the inserts in there that are supposed to be in there? Um, all of that is QC'd before I put resin in it and before it turns hard. Um, so to me, that's the biggest advantage of it. The other is a, um, a consistency in the parts. Right. Okay. Um, I've got a part, you know, every hull is going to weigh within a few pounds of each other as opposed to, you know, 500 pounds of each other depending on, you know, how anxious the guy was that day. Mm -hmm. uh, it's less environmentally an issue. You spray on a cold day, resin's thicker. Um, you know, right. Okay. So it's it, it ends up giving us a lot more control to the part, uh, especially if I've got cord parts, um, because of, it's already under vacuum. All my cores push down. I'm not going to have any air voids behind my core. Um, I got a consistent wet out all the way through. I don't have air voids in the part. Uh, so it, it makes a much more consistent quality part all the way through the process. Cool. All right. Do we want to? So, yeah. Um, yeah. All right, Matt. So we, we came up here now and we're actually looking at, I, I guess, the mold, right? Yep. So this is a mold for the F-22 hull. Um, this has got all of its material loaded in it, and they're just putting in the feed lines for the resin infusion process. Um, so like I said, if you'd look, it's a little bit difficult to see, but all of the layers of material are loaded into the boat. Um, gel coat, skin coat, multiple layers of material. Uh, this red material is actually an assist for flow. Um, so it'll peel out of the part after it's done. Um, so that won't be part of the final this boat? This will not be part of the final boat, but it's part of what, how the, how the piece gets made. And right. it kind of depends on what we're shooting over. We have to do that because we've got Kusa, uh, an inch and a half Kusa core on our full transom. So we need to assist to make sure that I've got full wet out on that. So what they're doing now is prepping the edges to put on, a, they're gonna put the bag uh, vacuum bag material over the top of this whole mold to seal it up. Uh, the white lines you see, basically the white stripes that right. are in there, those are going to be the feed lines where the resin is going to feed into the part right. and then infuse out into the whole part. And what's the time on that from the the, the vacuum or the, the bag being put in and the, the resin being injected? So, How right. long does that take? When they initially start the 
the uh, catalyze the first bucket of resin to go in to when they're closing everything off is right about 45 minutes to an hour. Okay. But so all the all the glass is kitted up when it comes up to these guys. Um, they've got a build book and and then install it basically to the print. Um, we come in and QC it, and then they they'll they'll do this, bag it up and and shoot it. Very cool. All right, let's uh, let's move on to the next step. Um, so after the parts are laminated and we demold them from the uh, from the mold, they come in here to which is our trim bay. Um, so here they're going to get all cut out. We're going to try and locate everything that's going to go into this specific boat. Um, so every boat, like I said, we're semi-custom, so we've got different cleat locations. <laughs> so there'll be paperwork that follows the process down so that the guys that bring the boats down here know exactly how they're supposed to trim it out uh, for each specific customer. Right. Um, we do a lot of work uh, with jigs and fixtures uh, to try and make sure that everything is always in the same spot. So these are, this is actually a removable piece um, that's a splash. So I can make sure that I'm locating all of my vents, uh, cut out openings. You can see other ones in there for speakers. Um, fuel, fuel part locations. Um, so as part of our processes, we, do a, we spend a lot of time building specialty carts and demolding fixtures for all of our boats, making sure that I've got drill and trim fixtures uh, so that when you get your boat, everything's in the same place, everything's supposed to fit uh, as it was designed to fit. Cool. All right, Matt, we're in a, we're in a different building now. Why don't you uh, take us through where we are? Okay, so once all of the lamination's done, parts are trimmed, ready to go, they come down to our assembly building. So here's where we're gonna take all the fiberglass, turn it into a boat. Um, so this happens to be a hull that just came down and they're pre-rigging it before final assembly before we put the deck on there. So here's where we're gonna put in all the through hull fittings, we're gonna mount all the pumps, fuel tanks, run wiring harnesses, everything that needs to, to be done. Um, turn the fiberglass shell into a, into a, into a working boat. Right. Um, so all of that's done. Uh, we do the same thing to the decks, um, which is one over here. Um, so the deck, same thing, everything's prepared for it. Uh, it's plumbed, it's wired, lights are in there, speakers are in there, hatches, um, all before it gets put together. Uh, once all of that's finished, um, the hull and deck then are joined together. Right. So I guess there's just one thing left to do. Ride the boat. Yep, yep. Yeah, so as soon as, yeah, as, soon as these get pinned together, um, they get the hard top, the console, final wiring, uh, final detail put on a trailer and... Right. And, uh, and be, I guess before we go take one of these bad boys out for a sea trial, I'm, I, you know, I noticed the engine Suzuki 140 here on this model. This is a model that's, uh, I guess this is your demo model, Yeah, you that's the demo model. So that's the boat we're going to be taking out. Do you work solely with Suzuki or just the easiest engine to get at this point? No, we rig up... Um, like I said, we're custom to whatever you want, so we'll rig up any manufacturer's engine uh, and electronics packages, stereo packages, etc. Well, I can't wait. I don't think I can wait any longer. <laughs> let, let, let's go. Let's go, Matt. All right, windy day here in Deep River, and we are about to do a sea trial, but Matt's going to show us the console first. Yep. So we got a forward entry console here, my, uh, Matt. Go ahead. Correct. We got a forward entry console, uh, and like I mentioned in the in the shop, one of the things we spent a lot of time working on was maintenance, accessibility issues, things like that. Wow! Look how clean um, that is. So when this is open, uh, this box it contains all of the battery systems for the boat. So I've got all of my 
my main battery switch. Wow. Uh, bat Nicely rigged too. Yep, batteries, uh, all of the systems are in here. So I've got an easy way to get to it. It's clean, it's separated from the rain stuff. So you put a porta potty in here, you put stuff in here, you're not messing with your batteries, you're not ripping wires off. Right, or anything like right. That. Very nice. And uh, you know, a little extra storage too if uh, you want to throw stuff in here if you're going out for the day. Correct. Awesome. Um, the other piece in this console, again, accessibility things. I've, I've been offshore and had to uh, try and solve some electrical problem. Something wasn't working uh, or working in the yard even and you're, you've got a, an access hole you can put your arm in or you can look in but you can't do both. <laughs> I know where you're going with this because I remember this from the Stewart show. There's a latch <laughs> right. right there. So basically this Second console right opens there. up. This drops down. Wow. And I've got full access to all of my switches, uh, electrical connections, fuse boxes, my NEMA network. It's all and it's so nicely rigged and everything is labeled beautiful. Right. So this is all easily accessed so I can get to it. If I got to troubleshoot it, I can. Right. You want to upgrade, add another screen, you know, an autopilot, whatever. It's going to be easy for the guys that are rigging up your boat afterwards if they happen to want to do something later. Really awesome and very unique feature. I, I don't think I've ever seen this on, on another boat, but fantastic. Whose idea was this? Um, we had actually seen it on another uh, another boat done where a guy had, had, had done it up. So we kind of took that idea and... and and made it just a little bit easier to use. Awesome. All right, let's, let's get her out and see what she can do. Okay. We have the mics on. Hopefully the, the wind does not come out so bad. There's Captain Matt at the helm. And we'll just do a quick overview. This is uh, the 22 offshore model. It's got twin Zook 140s. It's got a couple live wells here. How big are each live well, Matt? 22 gallons. 22? Yep. And you got a nice center seat here. Very nice. Got a big fish box on either side. You got rod holders galore here. You got three here, two cup holders, and you got four more on top. LED lighting, and then, as Matt said, they can build this any way you want. You want 10 rod holders on each side, that's <laughs> doable. Uh, that's the beauty of a semi-custom boat. And uh, this one does have, that's an interesting forward seat. So is that removable or? Yes, so that is? pops out with two quick releases so you can have it in there if somebody wants to sit um, or you can, you know, pop it out if you want more room for fishing or uh, whatever you're doing on your boat. Yeah, yeah, we got the nice uh, bolster seats here too. Flip down in case you want to sit. And Matt, we were talking about the price of this boat as rigged and you do get a lot of room back here the way you have this designed. Um, this, even though it's a 22, this feels like it has more room than certainly most other 22 foot boats, but yep, we even did a, a 23 or a 24, correct. this when, is really roomy. Right. When we started to build this boat, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how we could maximize the space on, on this boat. You know, granted that everybody's, you know, says, oh, it's a 22, I need a bigger boat. Uh, but we've got more deck area than most 24s and certainly any of the 22s that are out on the market right now. Right. Um, with the full length combing caps, we yeah. get the, the three piece feel, so you get you know an extra. Yeah, so you know, four this or is five what we mean. On each side. I'm tucking in here, able to fight a fish, and my, my toes are not stubbing against the, uh, the bottom of the boat. Right, and because and it's a cat, you know, you get three guys that hook the fish and they're all leaning on one side of the boat. You're not going to feel like you're flying out because right. the boat's going to stay stay level. Yeah, more balanced. And rigged like this with the T-top, with the twin engines, the exactly like this we were talking, you said about 130-ish? Uh, yeah, right in that range. Very nice. Very nice. And we all know how crazy boat prices are <laughs> these days. 130 is a really really good figure especially for a high quality build like this all right we're going to open her up and see what she can do so this boat's got almost zero dead lift in, or bow rise in it when you take off yep we're already at 17 miles an hour and you barely you're playing in at about 15. Twenty-three 
right now, 22 and a half. And, it, and it's windy. I mean, you can see it's white caps in here. It never shows up well on video, but. Right, it never looks as bad as it is. And as great as the GoPro is, one of the things it absolutely never shows well are the wave heights. Now, this is a very tight bait shop or an Indian River, one to two feet. You see the white caps, and this boat just ate it up. No pounding, no slamming. Uh, the proverbial phrase, I could have drank a cup of coffee, I promise you that was true here. What about sneeze? That's a term you hear a lot with cats. Correct. The thing that this front end does for us is it prevents pitching and moving following sneeze, and it doesn't sneeze. So, you can, you can ride it in anything. One of our customers over in, in St. Pete last week was talking about he went out he said he shouldn't have probably gone out because he was in seven plus footers. Um, and he said it, he never felt once like the boat was going to stop and he didn't have any water coming over the front. That's so awesome. It's a very, this, this whole shape is a very dry ride. Um, yeah, but you're right. I mean, uh, one to two footers in here. Again, you see the white cats. It never shows up on video, but we are smooth as can be back here. Uh, going 25 miles an hour. Any idea what our fuel burn is at this speed? Yeah, a little better than three right now. Three, three miles a gallon. Three miles a gallon. And how big is the tank? So they're um, 250, 112 gallons total. Oh. Um, so easily so 100 got, usable. Yep. Yeah, so you got basically a 300 mile range, however you're running. That's fantastic. And yeah, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but the video does not do justice to the seas we were in and super impressed with this boat, how it performs, the fuel efficiency, the ride. And I can't say enough good things about Matt and the team at Falcon. I got to meet his wife, Gina, very family oriented business. Linda, too. She helped us coordinate all this. Just a great group of people, great company. And if you're in the market for a smaller boat like this that has offshore capability, that can get you inshore if you, if you want to fish the mangroves or the bays, I would put this high, high, high on my list. Um, just a fantastic boat. And I'll include the contact details to Falcon in the video description if you want to get in touch with them. Really want to thank Matt and the team again for all the hospitality. I spent quite a few hours with them. They were so gracious with their time. Hope you enjoyed this video. I, I know it's a little denser than what you're used to with my videos. But if you did like this video, I'd really appreciate a like. And if you're not already a subscriber and you like content like this, please consider subscribing.